morning. You can have your seat. My name is Pastor Bob Van Arsdale, and I want to welcome you to Calvary Fellowship Church. I hope you've had a great Thanksgiving weekend. I, at the, one of the top of our Thanksgiving list was you guys. Uh, so we thank you so much for your support, for your love, for your generosity, uh, not just during this time of the year, but all throughout the year. We're so blessed as a church to have you here. And so today we have a Black Friday special for you. We don't have just one sermon for you. We have three for the price of one. How about that? So <laughs> I'm going to talk for a little bit. Then I'm going to ask Mike to come up and then Bill uh, will finish us off. So if you don't like what I say, wait for Mike. And then if, he, if you don't like what he says, wait for Bill. All right. Uh, today we're going to finish our study on uh, Lee's sermon series called Follow. And if you remember, way back in the first uh, week of that series, uh, Lee had two different easels up here. And he talked about my worldview, things that I can control, things that it's all about what I want in life. And then he had a second easel. And on that second easel, it had God. And what would God want for us? What would God want us to do? We, went through the last six weeks talking about this idea of glorifying God, of knowing who God is, of serving. Thank you for all of those who signed up to serve in these six-week uh, serving groups. Last week, we talked about this idea of praying and seeing God's answer to prayer. But this week, we want to tackle something probably that is harder for all of us. There's a struggle that we all have, that we want our worldview and not God's worldview, and that is this aspect of giving. I really believe that the acid test of all of our faith, that key to spiritual maturity, is, is figured out in this one question. How do I handle money? You see, as we grow in spiritual maturity, as we read God's word, as we interact with one another and talk about uh, deeper uh, things that we're accountable for, we understand that we don't own anything. We are simply managers of the things that God has given to us. God owns it all, and he just gives us a piece of it. And on top of that, God wants us to be uh, partners with him so that we would give not just for ourselves, but we would do things for eternal purposes. Jesus said it well many times, uh, especially in Matthew. He said, lay up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves cannot come in and steal. And so God, Jesus, wants us to give for eternal purposes. But that's a struggle. That's a struggle. We want things in our worldview. We want to be in control of the things that uh, we can control. And so today I want to just touch on two aspects of this aspect of giving, and they're both found in the book of Corinthians. Now Paul was a missionary to a whole bunch of churches in, uh, around Macedonia, Greece, and in the church to Corinth, when he would go, he would say, we have the poor in Jerusalem. Would you consider giving a financial gift to the people in Corinth or to the people in Jerusalem? And the people in Corinth were like, we're in. We want to give to, to the people, the poor in Jerusalem. And they said, we don't want to just give a little bit. We want to give a lot, a big generous gift. So think about it like for us as a group, we all decide that we want to give $100,000 to, let's say, Senegal or Mexico, and we say, we want to give that together. Well, Paul goes, that is fantastic. Thank you for that. But instead of giving it all at one time at the end where there's a, a pinch on us, give it systematically. Give it in little bits week by week. So if you have your Bibles, I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I just want to read one verse here. It's also in the back of your program. If you turn it over, it's on the right-hand side. It says here, On the first day of every week, 
Each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. A couple points here. One is that you should, you should give based upon the, uh, your income. So if you have a little income, he's saying give a little bit. If you have a lot of income, he says give more. But in proportion to your income. God wants us. Paul's encouraging us to give for eternal purposes. And most Americans here would say, we struggle with that. It's hard to give for eternal purposes when there's too much month left after, at the end of the money. We keep on saying we want to give. It's just hard to do. And statistics back that up. Uh, Bankrate.com did a survey and said that 63% of Americans, 63% cannot handle a $500 uh, car bill or a $1,000 emergency room bill. And yet, out of those who responded to that survey, four out of 10 had a major financial crisis in the past year. That's significant. Financial problems affect our marriages. Gallup has done a survey and said 56%, 56% of marriages fail, end in divorce, due to financial problems. We say money talks, and most of the times it says bye-bye. <laughs> we want financial freedom, but how do we get financial freedom? Well, financial freedom isn't making more money. It's not based on what we make. You've, you can... I'm sure you can attest that you can see people that make a lot of money and yet they're still constrained. Financial freedom comes when we, use, when we spend or how we spend what we have and we do it in a planned, systematic way. So how do we do that? Well, I have two options or two ideas for you. One is this thing called a budget. Budget seems like a negative word, a bad word. It means controlling what we spend. It doesn't have to be that way. It's just saying every dollar that I spend goes in one direction, one place, and that we don't spend every dollar or each dollar more than once. Now, there's a website that I have listed on your program, www.everydollar.com. It's a great place to start a budget. Second thing I'd encourage you to do is our Financial Peace University. We, have, we, have it, we do it about twice a year. We're doing our next class, January 16. Starts then. And it'll teach you how to plan, how to use your money wisely. Now listen up. This is, this is where it gets really cool. Last year we did a class. We had 30 individuals, 20 families. At the end of Financial Peace University, each family, on average, gained over $700 a week to their net worth, either paying off debt or, or saving money. $700 a week, that's over $6,300 per family. Why? Because they plan where they spend their money. And Paul was saying here that if you have a plan, plan to give also, make in your plan to give for eternal purposes. The other part with this, not just to plan to give, but how do you give? What is your heart behind giving? Paul says we should have a cheerful attitude, a positive attitude when giving. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I just want to read a couple, passes, a couple verses from here. And Paul is saying, in 1 Corinthians, he just talks a little bit about this, this collection. In 2 Corinthians, he writes a lot about it. Really, it's about two chapters. And he says this. I'm going to read 5 to 7. He says, So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. 
I want you to see that word here. Uh, Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. Every time we spend money, it reveals our heart. So if we want the latest iPhone, we will spend the money to get that, and that reveals our heart. If we want to look good when we drive around town, or we want a, a vehicle that will haul a lot of our stuff, or we just want reliable wheels, any vehicle that we get will determine our heart, will reveal what our heart is. If we eat out frequently, if we splurge on extravagant gifts, if we go on trips, or we invest in stocks, all of that reveals our heart, reveals what we desire to do with the money that has been given to us. Also, giving to God reveals our heart. God says he wants our giving to be something that is cheerful, something that we want to do because we're investing in eternal promises, eternal purposes. It's not something that it should be done out of compulsion. It shouldn't be done just because a pastor comes up here and tries to make you feel guilty. At Calvary, we try not to do that. We just make a need known when it's, when it's available. We've been blessed as a church. You have done great, and Pastor Mike's going to talk about that in a second. And so I want you to think about, how do I give? Do I give cheerfully? Is this something that, that I understand that every time I give, every time I give, it's done cheerfully? It's done for eternal purposes. I want to bring Pastor Mike up, and he's going to talk about how he moved from just a giver to a cheerful giver. Thank you, Bob. Well, good morning. This uh, is an opportunity just to share a little bit. We've had testimonies over the last number of months of people just sharing their heart of how God may have, have saved us, and also on the area of discipleship, how he's growing us to, to know him better. So I just wanted to take this time just to, to open up and, and share, let you look into to my heart and the heart of my wife as well as, as a couple, uh, what God's been doing in our lives over the last 27 years in the area of giving. So some of you may know that 27 years ago this November, God saved me. I trusted Jesus as my Savior, watching a Billy Graham crusade <clears throat> in my family room. About three months before, we had started coming to Calvary. And uh, so this is the only church that we've attended as followers of Jesus by his grace. Uh, for about 25 years, I had worked in the corporate world. And uh, by God's grace, in 2007, I was able to come on staff here as a pastor. So I've been on staff here for nine years. And I had no... So I was about 30 years old, 30 years old when I trusted Jesus. I had no background, no experience, no modeling and giving. So we kept coming to church, and and God began to to teach me things. If there's something I would like to emphasize in this little testimony I'm going to share is the power of God's word, the power of God's word to to transform our heart. So word goes out, God uses that to change us. And the other part is just to take one step at a time, steps of faith, Sometimes it seems overwhelming as to where God could take you to, but just take one step, and then he leads us to the next step. Well, as a a 30-year-old who's just now a baby Christian walking with Jesus, we'd come to worship services, and and, uh, I'd look around, and people every week were, as then we had plates that were being passed, and people were putting money into that place, looked cheerfully, consistently, and I, at at that point for me, it was kind of like I was in the reactive giving mode. It's kind of whatever was in my pocket. Maybe, and it wasn't always consistent, but maybe there was $5, maybe there was $10. If something was there, hey, let's do it. I didn't know much more about what God's word said, but it, I said, that's a, that was a huge step, step for me. So time went on, and it was probably a service not much like this. There was some teaching. At that point, it was Pastor Carl was teaching on giving. I still have a card. This is actually Pastor Bob's. I was trying to find mine at home. It's all crumpled up. Bob's is in better condition than mine. It, it was a card on the back and front and back that had principles for giving. Many of these are out of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. If you haven't grabbed one of the discussion guides each week, this week, would you, would you take one? They're at the door. They're on the, they'll be on the website as well. I took many of these principles and put them on there. And just to look up the scriptures, and it's not, as Bob would say, it's not, don't never feel under compulsion you know, never feel pressured to give, is that let God's word go out, and it'll, be, it'll begin to transform your heart. 
So there was a point that, that uh, Jill and I just said, let's, we want to, and one of those principles was, let's be planned. In the first of the week, let's set aside some funds. Let's be deliberate. Let's decide in our heart what to give. We learned that worship, or giving should be sacrificial, like King David said, I will not give that which costs me nothing. And it should be worshipful, done in faith, cheerfully. So we just decided we're going to begin to, to give each week. And it was like 20 or $25. But we began writing a check. I still write a check. I know there are all kinds of ways to give, but for me, that's just a, it's, it's a hands-on process of just participating in, in worship of the Lord. And you can give online in all kinds of ways. But for me, that's just a, a way that just helps me, helps to remind me that this is an act of worship to God. I think that probably ended up being, I, I was trying to think back in, I was probably, you know, the early 30s, that might have been about one and a half or two percent of our income at that time. Something we also did, I brought this up. So if we were going to do it, I began to, to just teach our kids. And you may have seen this little thing, it's kind of like a, a giving bank. And on it has a place for a bank, a store, and God, or church. And it was just be able to be, even begin to teach the principle to our kids. We had four ch- young children at that point to give the first to God. And you, I'm not even going to give you a percent. You, here, we, with our kids, say, hey, give a third to God, give a third to save a third, and, and you have a third to spend. And with their allowance, they just begin to teach the concept of giving to God first, the, the first fruits of what you have. And I'll tell you, that, there's a, that two, we, so we were at about maybe one and a half, two percent. A few weeks ago, now, probably now a couple, about a month and a half ago, we did this church-wide survey. And there was a question, if you could put up that slide, there's a question. One of the questions was, what percent of your income do you give to Calvary Fellowship? And the results are going to come up here. About 650 people responded to this survey. It's a good sample size. 19% of those responded said, they don't give anything. I'm not that different than where I was when I just trusted Jesus as a baby Christian. 13% give less than 1% of their income. 11% give in the 1% to 2% range. And you can see all the way up to those who 24% give more than 10%. And I looked at that and encouraged like, wow, a quarter of the body here is giving more than 10%. That's, they became a, an example to me. It's spurring me on. Much like uh, Paul talks about in these two chapters in, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, to, to spur one another on to giving, to excel in this grace of giving. And you can see there's about 43% are in that 0 to 2% range. We just say, hey, there's a lot of, that's, that's exactly where I was. There's an opportunity for God, by his grace, to keep stirring us on just to greater levels of giving, not to compare ourselves one, one to another, but to, to do it for the glory of God, and he changes us. See, I began to learn that God doesn't need our money. We need to give, because in that, we're, we develop a dependence on God, a, a faith in God, that he will, he will provide. So time went on, time went on, and there was some more teaching that came. And that, what I noticed as I was thinking through this story, a step of faith, before a step of faith came, a step in giving, there was teaching from God's word. Someone taught about tithing. You know, it's a principle in the Old Testament. You know, under the law, they had, actually, it wasn't even, a tithe was a tenth. But if you, there were three tithes that took place during a year. And if you added it all up, it was actually almost like 23% that the nation of Israel would give to the temple, to the poor, to the widows. And the, under the New Testament, there's no place where there's a specific percentage that's talked about. But the, what I took away, and there's a challenge out of Malachi 3, verse 10. In Malachi 3, Malachi was writing, God's actually speaking. He says, test me in this. Bring forth the whole tithe and see if the, the floodgates of heaven will be opened up. And it's not so much that we give to get something back. It's just to test God and it's, a, it's a, a test of our faith that God will provide. So in our mid-30s, we just said, all right, Jonah, let's, let's, this is huge. Let's begin to try that. Let's begin to tithe, to give a tenth, 10% of our income. And God has never stopped providing I'll tell you, there were times that we were tempted not to continue doing that. We'd look around and we'd see what other people had. There was covetousness that could sink in. Oh, well, we could go on. If we stop, God, if, if we stopped for, you know, a year or two, 
Let's think of what we could save up. You know, we're, we had four kids. We had a mortgage. We had car payments. We had all this stuff that just trying to make ends meet. But what if we stopped? And we'd be so better off. We'd, we'd save more and we'd be ready to, and then we'll get back to doing that. And each time it was like, no. Test me in this. So we just continued, continued to give. And God continued, provided, not, just in a, not so much in a financial way, but in spiritual blessings. There is a, there's a scripture that says, those who sow sparingly will reap sparingly. Those who sow generously will reap generously. I kept thinking, in the Old Testament, they, there was lots of blessing that the Old Testament followers of God had. How much more do we have? We have the indwelling Holy Spirit if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior. We have the whole word of God. We know that Jesus rose from the dead. God says through the church, the gospel is going to go forth. How much more to have the tithe be just a tutor to guide us in our giving? That's, I've always looked at that's just a great place to start. So God continued to, to, to move in our lives. And the last step that he began to take with some more teaching, he kind of urged us to not just to give to the local church on a consistent, planned, sacrificial, worshipful way. But then as your income would increase, to, to have some money so you could set aside almost like a free will offering as needs come up to, to be able to invest in the kingdom. You know, maybe there's a missionary that personally you want to support. Someone's going on a mission trip. You can come alongside them to encourage them. Someone in need, someone who has a need for a meal. To have resources available to invest in the kingdom. And I'll tell you, we, since in 2007, we came on staff. And there was a significant reduction in income that we had leaving. I was working at Siemens at the time. And from that point on, our income has been less in these last nine years. But by God's grace, I don't know how, but we've given more. I don't even, I don't know how, but by God's grace. So my challenge to us here is maybe there's something in what I've just shared that you could, you could see yourself in that. As a baby Christian, it's, there's nothing that you're giving. We had 19%, we're giving nothing. Maybe it's not to go to 10%. The first step is just to, maybe it's to take a meal, tie the meal, take one meal. You can go to Uno's, two for 20. <laughs> and say, I'm going to give that to the Lord. I'm not going to eat. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast and pray. I'll give that as an offering to God. That's huge across our body. And just take that step. Maybe it's someone else who was giving consistently and you're, maybe it's, you're being nudged by the God, not by me, but by the, through the Holy Spirit of God to, to maybe it's moving to a tithe. Maybe, it's even, maybe you've been doing that for years. 25%, a quarter of our people are giving 10% or more. Maybe it's, it's become comfortable. And maybe there's a challenge to, God, stretch me. Move me beyond that point. Test me in this. And see how God will provide. Not that we're giving to God to get something back from him. We're giving to demonstrate our dependence on him. He's worthy of it. He owns it all. So even today, as we're going to get ready to take our offering. Today, my prayer has been this. Today would be a spiritual marker in our lives. In some way, God's going to call you, as the word of God's going out, to take a step. A step of faith to give in ways that would surprise you, but would be so honoring to God. So the buckets are on either side as you begin to pass them. I'd just like to pray for us as we give here. Lord God, we, we praise you for being the God who gave it all. Jesus, you, you were rich. You left heaven and became poor for us so that we who were poor could become rich in you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you even now for the, the privilege, the opportunity, the joy of being able to give back to you what you've already given to us. And Lord, would today be a spiritual marker in the lives of this church, in the lives of each of us here. Would you move us to a place that we never thought we would get to? And we'd give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Take your seats. Appreciate Pastor Bob and Pastor Mike, Pastor Lee and John that are in my life on a day-to-day -day basis challenging me to grow. In my faith, <clears throat> I'm Pastor Bill, and uh, most of my responsibilities center around our missionaries that are serving all over the world. I'll talk about them. I can't pass that opportunity in just a couple of minutes. Are you ready to eat some more? 
<laughs> what a weekend to ask that kind of question. I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Both Bob and Mike have been talking about chapter 8 and chapter 9. This is the two most inclusive and expansive verses that we have in the Bible about the topic of giving. Lots of principles that are in there. But I'd like to start off in the very beginning of this message in chapter 8 and 9 and then go to the second principle in the middle of chapter 9. So it's sort of like the, the top of the roll and the bottom of the roll. And they've given you all the meat in between, but here we go. Look with me, if you would, at verse number 2 in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to read 2, 3, and 4. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. They testified, they gave as much as they were able, and yet beyond their ability. Watched a lot of football this weekend. A little bit of ice hockey, sad to say. But football primarily. I love watching these athletes in their prime. These fantastic catches. Fantastic interceptions. And the tackling. If, if, it, if one tackle were to happen to me, I'd never get up again. But each one of these guys that are out there on the field are doing it to the best of their ability. They could not play football beyond their ability, and their ability is quite good. What about in our giving? How do you give, how do they give beyond their ability? They gave as much as they could, and then beyond their ability. That's what I call giving in faith. And I think that's where Paul wants to lead us because this is the very crux of the matter of giving. God does not need your finances to accomplish his mission. He needs your finances to show him that your faith is a reality. He wants you to put your needs second and the needs of others first. And so when you get that paycheck, you give first to the Lord and you live on what's left. And sometimes you give more to the Lord than a neighbor or a friend, if they ever found out, would say, you're crazy. How are you going to make that mortgage payment? How are you going to make that car payment? Christmas is coming. Don't short suit. The kids are okay, but not the grandkids. No. We give to the Lord first, and then we claim the promise that was not yet written. But it's found in Philippians 4.19. My God will supply. What's that next word? Oh, my God will supply all your needs out of his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. This giving in faith is really, for me, a matter of the heart. I have my taxes done by someone else outside of the family. And that person, that accountant, knows that I'm a pastor. Could you imagine if he saw in my taxes a percentage that wasn't even close to maybe what the Lord wants for me? And we're talking percentages. We are not talking amounts. Remember that widow who gave just two little tiny mites? The Lord said she gave more than all of these others because it is about percentage. And if you were to look at my tax return, you'd probably say, whoa, on a pastor's salary. I don't say that braggingly, but here's the sad 
Here's the sad part for me. That percentage has stayed the same since I've been a pastor. And I love prepping for these kind of messages because the Holy Spirit is just filleting my soul open and saying, Bill, when are you going to change that percentage? You're giving in a lifestyle that's comfortable for Yeah, yeah. You like the percentage. Some people would be very thrilled if they had that kind of percentage. And I'm not saying it's really high. I just, the Lord is saying, when are you going to trust me? I go back to, it's a, a miracle that Christ did. It's in all three of the first Gospels, but I like Mark's version. Where the disciples are trying to cast a demon out of a little boy. His father brought the little boy to him. And the Lord comes up because the disciples weren't having any good fortune with it. And says, what's the issue? He says, I brought my little boy to your disciples, but they could not cast out the demon. Master, if you can, please cast out the demon. And Jesus replies, if you can, all things are possible for those who believe. And the man responds, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. For me, that's the giving piece. I believe. I've seen the Lord faithful all these years. But there are still parts in my budget where I don't believe. And that's the rub for me. Lord, I believe. You know. I believe. But there are parts of me that I'm holding back for myself because I want to make sure that I can take care of it because I haven't trusted you to take care of it. This last principle is found in chapter 9. I'm going to read at verse 12 and 13. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. So this is the result of their generous giving. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that, comp uh, that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity, and he goes on. Because of your giving, specifically now to Calvary Fellowship, men and women around the world are praising God who never even knew God before. We support Nathan and Jessica in China. We support Alan and Melissa. Many of you got to know them this last year. Somewhere in North Africa, a very closed country. We support Carl Green, who does most of his ministry in the southern part of Africa, in Zambia, Zimbabwe, and even up into Iraq. And we support the Melons over in France who have been there and labored in a very hard and dry country for almost 30 years now. Because of your giving, there are short-term trips that take place all over the world. I'm going to ask Barb if she'd throw up picture number one there. I had the privilege for the last several years, and Bob has done it even longer than me, to go down to Mexico and work with Tom and Sandy Basile, who will be here over the holidays. I encourage you to get to know them and come to their luncheon that we're going to have on the 15th of December. This particular cistern is being installed in a school that children do not know God. The mayor does not know God. But the councilwoman is a woman of peace who is opening door after door after door and is getting her eyes open to the gospel of Christ because of your giving. Last Sunday, we had the privilege of hearing the Moldova team, picture number two, that just came back from Eastern Europe, where they were to spend time with children who live in orphanages because their parents just can't take care of them, maybe even have passed away. 
This is a short-term trip that breaks your heart. And our presence, because of your giving, enables the local believers to go in and take these children out of the orphanages into Christian homes to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The third slide, the village where Philippe and Lori Senegal live, and they can conduct their sports friends activities. You got to know them. They're coming back in a little piece. They've been there for four years now, working with sports friends and soccer camps and training Christian soccer coaches to lead children to the Lord. We took a team two years ago, and several of those kids were sitting there opening up their Operation Christmas Child boxes that you guys possibly stuffed. And then finally, in this fourth slide, is the village of Babak. Pastor Mike goes there every year, leading a team. I've been there five times, not part of his team, but what an experience. And you'll see a couple of men there. Gary Rock used to work here on staff. Pastor Antoine Juf. I will get the names mixed up. In the background, he's the church planner and helps in translation. The guy on the far right is Pastor Antoine John of the village of Babak. And your giving monthly enables us to pay him to do nothing but pastor people in this village that we have adopted to conduct children's clubs, to put in gardens and send children to a camp for a one-year agricultural study so that they can come back plant their own gardens so Pastor Antoine can give up his monthly support to the next village. It's disciple making disciple making disciple. And the man in the middle, I don't know his name, but he is, I believe, because he owns a horse, one of the richest men in the village of Jaman. I went into his hut. He's got a picture on the wall picture of Pastor Mike. <laughs> a picture of Pastor Mike on the wall. Because Pastor Mike, because of your giving, brought the gospel. Brought the gospel to that village of Juma. Because of your giving, men and women all over the world. And we didn't even mention Costa Rica and and Coatesville right here, and some of the other countries. Given faith beyond your ability, and as a result, men and women all over this world will praise God. The very last verse in this chapter, verse 15, thanks be to God for his undescribable gift. Those of you who are believers in Jesus Christ know what that gift is. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward now. And we're going to take communion again today as we begin this season of thanksgiving, this season of remembering the birth of our Lord and Savior. That is part of this undescribable gift. The more I spend time thinking about it, the less I can put it into words. Because along with Jesus Christ being given to this world, his life, his death, and his resurrection, we have the opportunity to spend eternity with our Creator. Eternity with our Creator because of what he has done. Now, this time that we call communion or the Lord's table is for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And we ask you, if you haven't made that step yet, we don't want to exclude you. You can take that step simply right now by saying, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. Help me in my unbelief. And for those of you who are already his children, we're told to examine ourselves. 
not to take this cup in an unworthy manner. When I think of giving this time of year, I also think of forgiving. And many of the stories that we as pastors hear involve this issue of forgiveness or a lack of forgiveness. If you're harboring something in your heart against another brother or sister, think long and hard of the forgiveness that has been granted to you because of what Christ did on the cross, that indescribable gift. And I'd ask you to make that right. To forgive, just as you have been forgiven as well. Take the double cups and we'll eat and drink together in just a few moments. I'd ask you to take the wafer and for a moment focus on the body of Christ. What was done to him on the cross done to him in the courtyard before the cross. Even the denial of some of his disciples. His body was given for us. And we read again in Corinthians, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. In thanks, do this in remembrance of him. Let's eat together. And in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant. I don't think the disciples understood what he was talking about. Very shortly they would. It's the new covenant, the new testament, the new promise in his blood. And we do this whenever we drink it in remembrance of him until he returns. That second coming. Let's drink together. Heavenly Father, the more words I speak, the more clouded it becomes because it is truly an indescribable gift that you have given us. So simply, we thank you for your Son. We thank you for what he has done for us through his body and blood on the cross, and we promise to never forget until the day we see him face to face in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen.